In the spirit of reconciliation, the entire team at Curious Freedom acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connection to land, waters and community. We acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people listening today. I would like to acknowledge in particular the Darug people who are the original custodians on the land on which I record this podcast. Thank you for showing us what curious freedom can look like. And welcome to the Curious Freedom Podcast with me, Kirsty Fruja, and my friend, Mike. Welcome, Mike. Hello, Kirsty. It is good to be considered your friend. So <laughs> it's great to be part of the um, podcast. I'm excited. So Mike and I have known each other for, I would say, um, how old are our eldest? So nine years, we've probably known each other. Mike Gore is the founder of Charitable along with his partner, Joss, and I have got him on because I just love the concept of charitable and I wanted to do everything I can to cheer you on and support you. So tell us who Mike Gore is and what is charitable and some of your story. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks. Um, as I said before, thanks so much for having us along. Charitable is essentially, it's like the Uber Eats of giving to charities, right? So as a user or anyone listening to the podcast, I mean, my gosh, I, I built it so selfishly, Kirsty, but I built it in so many ways to make giving easier for me because I was pretty jack of how ungenerous I was because of all the barriers and hurdles. And my gosh, I am so sick of clicking a, a square with a streetlight in it and getting it wrong. So I thought, what if we created like one app where you could just actually find any charity, any registered charity you want in Australia? You got an annual giving statement, so you never had to look for a tax receipt again. It was commission-free, so you knew all of your donation was going to the charity. What if we built that kind of app? And as you know, Kirsty, I've spent the last 12 years of my life working in the charity sector, and I thought, hey, if we built this, man, it might actually help the world of both charities and individuals. And so it is, yeah, ultimately the Uber Eats of being able to give to charities. I love it. And I know you just said why you started it, but tell us more about how that came about. Like you've been working in the not-for-profit sector for a long time. Yeah. So I um, I had the privilege of running a, um, a $10 million charity or just under $10 million that worked specifically in the faith-based sector. Now, over those 12 years, I have traveled all to all parts of the world. You know, I've seen the best parts of humanity. I've seen some of the most trying parts of humanity spent time in the Middle East in countries like Syria and Iraq at the height of the war with ISIS, delivered humanitarian aid on the Syrian border in Lebanon. I mean, lots and lots of stories that you know, and I've shared with you before, Kirsty, that to be honest, most of the world would never get to see. However, in all of those journeys, you know, I met countless men, women, and children that were not dissimilar to you and I, unbelievably loving parents, beautifully spirited, you know. The thing with the war with ISIS, and man, people do not realise this, is having spent time in, in multiple countries, in multiple refugee camps, the people living as refugees, which, to be honest, as a Westerner, I don't really look like it, but as a Westerner living in Australia, you, you can often, in some ways, be culturally coached to appear or, or believe that refugees are sort of down and out as no hopers, you know, this kind of stuff. But, but sitting in camps with clinical psychologists now living in tents, school principals having had to flee their home with nothing, not even shoes, because ISIS came in the middle of the night and, and that was when they had to leave, counsellors, I mean, highly educated and trained people who now found themselves living as internally displaced people or refugees, it was heartbreaking. And for me, in so many ways, it's part of my wider life story, but drives me to say, it doesn't take much for us to use our generosity to change and shape the lives of someone who, for all intents and purposes, are no different to you or I. They bleed the same red, they have the same heart and aspirations to raise their family in a safe environment, they have the same dreams for their children, and if we can make giving easier, whether you are someone living in a refugee camp, whether you're a First Nations person in Australia, whether you are a young person wrestling with gender and identity and terrified to speak about it, well, you know what? If we can make giving easier 
and remove those barriers, then there is a sneaking suspicion in my mind that we might very well be able to change the world. I love it. I think that's one of the challenges of living and growing up as we did, you for the most part, (laughs) but I did in Australia is that we are an island nation and we have no flippant idea of what it's like to live anywhere else but an island that is so not likely to be invaded at any time soon. So it's so far out of our collective imagination and we've seen through all of our government's policies, no matter which side, and what's just happened with our referendum is that we have such little collective imagination for how life can be so exactly the same and so very different in other parts of the world. And you and all of your incredible stories are a testament to that. And that's why I'm like, I just wish that more people could understand that the person being bombed in Gaza is the same as you and I. And the person who got taken by Hamas in Israel is the same as you and I. Mm -hmm. And our First Nations people are the same. We have similar dreams and similar values and similar hopes and like and we're all human so anyway i will get off my yeah, soapbox look, no it's, well look it's not really a, it's not it's not a soapbox to be honest i mean w- w- one of the the main things we can default to in some of the stories i might share would be the, the impact of war but you know agriculture is another one and we have unbelievable benefit from here in australia famine you know, it's not an impact of war, but famine is unbelievably impactful to the quality of life. Gender bias and gender hierarchical societies and cultures that oppress women are unbelievably destructive to the forward movement of women in society and culture. And so Australia, yes, we may be an island nation, but there's actually amazingly beautiful stuff around agriculture, around gender equality that is changing, and all of these things that actually make Australia beautiful. One of the things I would say, and we'll get to Israel and Palestine in a moment, but one of the things we would I would say is that we also need to realise that we're living in a time in the world, particularly referendums, right? Referendums, they, they want to force you to live at either end of a scale. They want to force you to a yes or they want to force you to a no. They make you have a mistaken belief, in my view, that either you see it as a yes, Kirsty, and I see it as a no or vice versa, the reality is, remember, if you picture a scale, 50%, right? My gut feel is 80% of Australia were what I would call a fragile yes or a fragile no, right? They're, they're not polarised yeses and polarised noes, passionately yeses, passionately noes. There are some people that fall into that, but what we're left to feel as a society in a referendum where the ultimate outcome is decided by a yes or a no is that all of Australia saw it this way. Well, actually... I think for the very overwhelming majority, we're actually closer than we think. And the example I could share with you is that in my time in Israel and Palestine, one of the most heartbreaking things was, I spent a lot of time in both of those parts, by the way, Israel and Palestine, but the wall that divides part of those nations is quite literally a concrete wall. I remember walking alongside the wall as this kind of barbed wire chain sort of roofing above you. It's quite low. But it's, it's full and covered almost to the point in some areas where it's pitch black and you're walking through these markets where it really is black and you can see lights and candles in the middle of the day that are illuminating your pathway because there is so much sort of stuff on top of this chain roofing. And that's because projectiles would come over the wall, rocks, bottles, other things, and this chain fence above you was actually to protect the people underneath it. But what's absolutely mind-blowing was on either side of that fence i would see kids kicking a soccer ball (laughs) right i would see other kids playing games parents sitting around 44 gallon drums in the middle of winter with fire but chatting laughing eating fellowshipping food right and what struck me and blew my mind was the fact that on any other oval in any other country those two kids and groups of kids kicking a soccer ball would have an absolutely brilliant time playing together, right? But for a cultural indoctrination and a variety of other reasons that are unbelievably complex and I'm not simplifying it, kids that love soccer, love sport, love to laugh, love to play, end up also picking up rocks and missiles and throwing them over the fence hoping they hit someone. And I think what I've learned in the moment in the middle of that is that we are so similar in so many ways 
and generosity and financial help is in so many ways a salve to so much of that wound because if we can actually use some of our freedom here in Australia to serve and support people both in our nation and overseas and we can remove the barriers to do that, then I believe, again, that charitable, there is a a sneaking suspicion that we may be able to change the way giving is being done forever. Even this morning, before I hopped on to chat to you, I was on Instagram, which I'm not on very often, but I was this morning and watching some videos of what is happening at the moment in Israel and Palestine. And my heart is breaking. And I'm like, how do I make a difference in this situation that just seems so incredibly overwhelming? And what difference does a suburban housewife in Sydney, what difference can she make? And then I was like, uh, (laughs) I'm interviewing Mike in a couple of minutes. I know how I can make a difference. I can hop on the charitable app and donate some money so that at least my conscience is feeling a bit better that I'm actually doing something. Yeah, and I, look, I think that's important. And for for the listeners, the way the app works is that it, it has any of the Australian charities registered charity. So you, you, we're not the ones taking and using your money charitable. What we're doing is we're kind of providing the pathway. So I would often say, you know, it sounds a bit too businessy, but anyway, I would say that accessibility will always increase a market's size, right? So if you make it easier for you and I to book a bed to sleep in, Airbnb, tourism grows. You make it easier to order food to your home and home delivery goes, you know, Uber Eats. If we can make it easier for people to give, that's ultimately what Charitable is trying to do, make it easier for people to give, then hopefully giving grows. And so what we do is on the app, you would find a curated list of organizations and charities working in the Middle East, working with First Nations or whatever is culturally relevant at the moment that you can give to. And again, it's commission-free. The money would sit in a trust account and then we remit it to that nominated charity just wanted to make it overwhelmingly clear it is not charitable as such that is doing the work in these nations. We are simply providing the technology that allows you to find a trusted charity and say in a matter of seconds, hey, I made a difference today and the money is going to them. Yeah. So have you got every registered charity in Australia on your app yet or is that still work in progress? It's a good question. What we do is we use something called the Australian Charities Commission. Now, most charities need to register with the commission. I think there's 52,000, believe it or not, charities in Australia. We use a subset. We are not partnered with them, but we use a subset of that database to populate the app. So there are 39,000 charities currently on the app, but not necessarily like they're not our customers. They're just on there for our users to give to, okay? Mm -hmm. 39,000 because we remove any that have had their licenses revoked, any whose financial reporting is not up to date. We're trying to make it a trustworthy place for users to be able to know their giving is going to the right place. Like if you think back to Celeste Barber a few years ago, we often say, don't be a Celeste. We love Celeste, by the way. But sadly, her generosity saw, I think, 52 or $53 million get caught up in legislative application. Whereas if Charitable had existed back then, well, she could have directed all these users to the Charitable platform. You can find, hey, I want to help animals, I want to help families, I want to do equipment, whatever it might be. And users, you can direct your donation to whatever interest you have and it will go there. So there's no risks around it being caught up in legislation because you're choosing where it goes. And so, you know, we hope to reach out to her one day, but um, don't be a Celeste, right? She really wanted to do something great in the world and sadly, the society was stacked against her or the legislation was stacked against her. So we build it to help her and others say, hey, go to Charitable, find what you want to serve and support when it comes to bushfires, war, famine, whatever it might be, and give directly to that entity. And so, yeah, there's 39,000 on there. And the way we would survive or make money, just to be clear, is we hope the charities will agree to cover the costs of technology by paying a monthly fee to access some premium benefits. Because in a world where there's increasing skepticism around data security, even trust when it comes to phone calls, text messages, and emails, we think that Charitable is an unbelievably important platform for charities to embrace and adopt so that they can say to people, hey, just give on Charitable. It's safe, you're in control, and it's trusted. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, but I get phone calls every week from charities asking for my money. And like the people who are working on their call lines are so lovely and so personable. I mean, that's why they've got their job. But sometimes I'm all like, are you like, are you legit? Like, and that just goes through my head. Like, 
Mm. Is this person real or are they a scam? <laughs> is this somebody from Nigeria trying to get my money? <laughs> it's only going to get worse. And so we need to have safe practices. You know, I'd say that there's the five C's that you and I as donors or users, customers for that matter, want. We want to have, in today's world, we want a sense of choice. So charitable, you can choose from 39,000. Convenience. So we want it to be easy. I don't want to get off the lounge, as terrible as it sounds, to get my wallet. We want to feel like we're in control. And so Charitable is an app that is native on your phone and you're in control of. We want a sense of community, a purpose bigger than ourselves. And then finally, we want confidence that it is safe and it's secure to use. And so we built Charitable to tick those five Cs, convenience, choice, community, control, and confidence. And and I think for both users and charities, they are important five principles that we need to be really delivering on and providing these days. Yeah, and I love the fact that your app has all those 39, you've weeded out the people, all the charities that aren't holding up to a standard, like you said, um, but that I am in control. Like if I want my money to only go to faith-based places, I can choose that. If I only want my money to go to LGB QI mm-hmm. stuff, it can go to only those charities. If I want my money to go to only bushfire relief, it can only go to bushfire. <laughs> like that, I love that idea of control and it's my choice and it will help me. <laughs> when I get the phone call from those lovely people who have got my number to go, thanks so much. Have you thought about using charitable? Because I use charitable (laughs) to make all of my donations. Well, my dad is mid seventies and that's how he does it now because he'll be like, look, I'm really nervous about giving my credit card details over Mm -hmm. the phone. He'll just say, look, I'll find you on charitable and give to you that way. And so he can hang the phone up, give straight away, but also know that he's in control. He can say, look, I'm going to go on this app I'm going to find the place that they just spoke to me about and I'm going to give just because I just don't feel safe. I I still love you. You sound like a lovely person, but I do just want to make sure that I am protecting myself. I'm going to give you to you through this vessel. So most, as I said before, charity should be on there. The app is free to use and it is commission free. Our hope is that if you are having those conversations, Kirsty, you can say, hey, you should explore these guys. I trust them. They are good and it would be great to see you work with them. They're already on there and they can use the app for free. The other one is that schools, my gosh, schools are on there, particularly Christian schools. I am so sick of finding a gold coin. This could revolutionize the way (laughs) Mufti days are done. And so we're hoping that um, schools and other, like churches, religious organizations, it's a brilliant way to be able to take a commission-free donation and, and a relevant way that us as congregational members, parents at schools or donors have those five Cs when it comes to our giving. I might go and suggest that to my kids' school Come on. today. Yeah. <laughs> I just got an email about a fundraiser. I am absolutely going to reply back. Man, it will change the game. I know we don't have a lot of time left because we chatted too much before we started recording. <laughs> <laughs> so you were just at a conference. South by Southwest, yeah. And you got to be on stage and, and be one of the speakers. So congratulations on that. Thank you. You've got a pretty cool story. <laughs> and so do you want to share your cool upbringing or interesting story? I think, I mean, I'd love to, happy to. And and one of the things I'd love to say to the listeners is that we, we do live in a society that likes to hero the story more so than the process in building the person featured in the story. And so, yeah, my life was interesting and complex, but in many ways, charitable serves as my pay it forward for the multitude of people that actually helped build me. And so the story as interesting and wonderful as it sounds, it is only symptomatic of the actions of so many other people as opposed to just me as the hero of that story. And if you're listening today, I think we we need to not place a hierarchy on our own personal story. I think that you can use whatever your story is, as dry or as inane as you may see it to be, or as elaborate and complex as it is, you can actually use it to shape the lives of those around you. And so for me, I was abandoned at birth in India. Um, I definitely don't sound Indian, but I was abandoned at birth in India, and from what I understand, found by a pediatrician and placed into an orphanage. Now, 
in India, they have something called the caste system. It's a established hierarchy of classes that they basically leave people pigeonholed to whatever caste they get put into. And they believe within Hinduism, based on whatever you've done in your previous life, determines the circumstances amidst which you were born. And so for me, to be abandoned at birth meant I'd done something fairly terrible in a previous life, and because of that was unable to be adopted. Now in 1977, Kirsty, a family in Australia had two biological daughters of their own. They applied for an adoption, and over the next four years, they heard a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of red tape, but nothing conclusive about the adoption. In fact, in 1981, the year that I was born, they decided to give up on adopting a child, spent the money they had saved on a trip to America with their two daughters, took them to Disneyland as a way of closing that chapter and moving on in life. Anyway, while I was in this orphanage, a nurse there took a liking to me. One night, she grabbed me and she smuggled me across the state border and she bribed some nuns, with cash, I believe, to change my birth certificate, which would allow me to be adopted under that state's law. And so this family got back from their trip to America and they got a phone call saying, the adoption's gone through and more than that, your son will be at the airport at the weekend. Now, for them, they were like, uh, no, we have no money, that can't be possible. And they said, well, it's all gone through, your son will be at the airport at the weekend. They were a faith-based Christian family. They were praying about it that night. The next day, the mother was driving a car with her two daughters. She had a car crash and wrote the car off without a scratch or a bruise to anyone in the car. And what she said to me was, what was a miracle was that two days later, the day before I was scheduled to arrive in Sydney, the insurance money had been returned to her bank account. And more than that, it was to the exact dollar that was needed to pay for the adoption, not a dollar more and not a dollar less, which was you know, an amazing providential way to end up in Australia. I then grew up, I guess, in the Sutherland Shire, the, the probably the whitest part of Australia you could ever grow up in in the 80s. I was the only brown kid in school until I was 16 when I moved away from the Shire. I've had lots of racism and opposition in my life. I remember as a young kid in school walking across a playground, having a girl two years older than me come over and say, you black motherfucker, and spat all over me. You know, lots of random opposition uh, at times in growing up as a brown kid in, in a relatively white culture. Now, again, to be clear for your listeners, I don't live under the banner of racial oppression, nor do I hold that over you or anyone else listening to this. It is a reality of my story and through particularly the actions of women, two beautiful sisters, a a kind mum and a great father, yeah, I've had an ability to overcome a lot of that cultural opposition, but in so many ways, it now drives me to say it's my pay it forward in charitable. And why my hope is that, to be honest, every single person listening will go and at least download the app, check it out use it because I'm like, you know what? It's not about becoming rich and famous. It's about saying, I actually don't know what your life story is, but charitable can can be your pay it forward too. Because whether it's an eating disorder, whether it is racial opposition, whether it's opposition based on the color of your hair or the shape of your body, we all actually have a pay it forward and a purpose. And I hope that we've created a platform that allows each and every one of us listening to live it out as our pay it forward. Again, I don't care about being rich and famous, but what I do want you to do is, in some ways, find someone you can serve and support and use charitable to do it because we each have a story that we can use to shape the purpose in someone else's life. And this, dear listeners, is why we're friends. (laughs) You can hear what a beautiful heart Mike has and that is why him and his family and his beautiful, beautiful wife uh, friends of mine. <laughs> Mike, what's the easiest way for people to find the app? Is it just go to yeah. the App Store and. Yeah, the App Store or Google Play and to search for charitable. It was no E. We had to make it sound like a techie brand, right? So C H A R I T A B L, an orange C logo, the one with the best reviews and most reviews. <laughs> but you go find it. Like, I, I promise you, we build it because it makes life easier and we all live out of apps that make our lives easier. It is not a burden. It is not something you want to live in every day. It's just an app that when, you know what, when the crap hits a fan and you want to do something good in the world, it's your Superman suit that you can to go and throw on in a matter of seconds and make a difference in the world. So please download it, check it out. We are not here to, to take your money. We're here to make the world a better place. Mm, I love it. Thank you for letting me get a little political today. Come Thank on. you for encouraging me in the 
my journey of life. And thank you for reminding all of us that our stories matter and it matters because it can move us forward and change the world. Do you know what I love about having a podcast the most, Mike, (laughs) is that I will never know the ripple effects of the podcast. Like Mm. I don't hear from everybody. I don't get to see inside their homes and what difference they've made. I don't get to meet everybody in their life, but I get to think of the podcast as a ripple effect and that Mm. I will never know the impact and and I don't need to know the impact. Like I, I think that that's what I love most is that it's not about ego for me. It's not about I need to know every effect that I've had on life and on other people. I can just put good out into the world and know that it's going to have a ripple effect. And that's what I love about charitable. And yeah. what you're creating is that you'll never know the impact of it and you don't care in the ego sense. You don't need to know all the ripple effects. You can just see the big figures that, yes, charitable has been able to pass on 100% of the money that it's made by people mm. giving. And remember, trust the journey, be kind to yourself, And when life overwhelms you, just keep walking because the past should never determine your present. We need to be driven by a picture of who we can become in the future. And my hope is that's an encouragement to someone listening today is that for you who feel overwhelmed or as though your past is is suffocating you, remember, just keep walking, trust the journey, be kind to yourself and let the future of who you can become shape you more than the past of which we so often live under. And again. Small acts of kindness and charity will change the world. Well, I will put a link in the show notes for everybody for Google Play and Apple Store for people to find charitable. And I thank you so much, my friend, for agreeing to be on my humble little podcast. (laughs) I hope that you can continue to help the ripple effect of charitable. Well, thank you. I appreciate it and uh, love all you're doing and would be here any day of the week you ask me to. So love you a bit and hope it has all of the impact you hope it will. Mm, thanks, mate. All right, dear listeners, we'll be, I will be back with you next week and we'll see if Mike will come back and share more <laughs> sometime. Thanks. Have a great week. Bye. Bye.